Chatan. 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 Yes, I think for the interest of time, we need to start. Yeah, sure. Because I'm seeing there are five, already five attendees. Yeah, the rest will find us on our way as we move. We can't wait. So I would like to take this time and this opportunity to welcome you on this session. Um, by name of Kajun Frank, I'm the moderator of today and I'm the principal examiner of VICSAC. I've been moderating today's session, which is settled uh, management accounting. Uh, we are not to understand what we're going to do before we actually proceed. Because people may have expect or may be expecting to have lectures, but are not going to lecture. Um, we are only going to give exam tips specific for management accounting. And the, myself with my colleague, Chato Nide who is also Prince Examiner uh, we will be moderating today's session that will be facilitated by Charles Omanyu, who is the director of School of Accountants at University of Tigali, and the, a lecturer at University of Tigali, and at the same time, a tutor of management accounting and performance management at University of Tigali. So uh, I hope we will enjoy, and I hope you are ready to throw a lot of questions to him so that he can give you the tips for you to be able to approach professional courses. Because ideally, what we are trying to do is, from our own observation from the previous exam, most of the students fail not because they don't understand the concept. Uh, they, but they don't understand how to approach professional exams or professional uh, qualification papers. And I uh, specifically like to tell you that professional qualifications are totally different from academic qualifications because the way you approach, when it comes to academics, you'll be, the exams will be set by the tutors or the lecturer who has lectured you. 
but here it's totally different. Someone who is going to teach you is not the person who is examining you, and the person who examining you is not the, going to be the person who is marking you. So you've got to understand the tips of how to approach the exam uh, so that you can be able to get the pass mark. Uh, the reason I'm saying the pass mark is you can get 90% or 100%, but if you get 100% and someone else gets 50%, you all get a pass. And our main objective is to get a pass. If you get 100 or 90%, well and good. But our main objective is for you to get a pass, which is 50%. Uh, so I think that we help you. He has that experience. He has taught for several years. He has examined, he has marked, so he has the experience to give you the right uh, tips and right skills to be able to pass management accounting. So without much further ado, I would like to call upon Charles to come and take over the platform. Charles, you're welcome. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Claude, the principal examiner, and the other panelists. As, uh, as uh, Mr. Claude has said, I'm Charles Omanyo. I've been teaching management accounting for slightly, now it's almost 10 years since I started teaching management accounting. So I believe with the experience that I have, I've also been uh, a marker and with the experience that I have at least, I believe I can guide you all through this session. I want the session really to be as interactive as possible. As Mr. Claude, has, uh, as Mr. Kajunga said, this really is not a lecturing session. I, it's really a guiding session to enable us prepare for the exams because we realize most of us have read years, but some, sometimes uh, reading alone is not sufficient in order to pass exams. You must really be in a position to understand the examiner's approach. So I'll break my session. I'm seeing we are remaining with around two hours, 40 minutes approximately that. I'll break my session into three parts. The first part will be giving you an overview of really what is this management accounting? What is the examiner interested in? What does he look at? How should we present ourselves in exams? And then the second session, I'll give an overview of management accounting. Basically, what should you prepare for in exams of management accounting? And then maybe the last session, just sample. Whenever we have questions, we can always come on board. So basically to start, and if you have a question, you can go to the chat section and, and, and type, or you can raise your hand. There is an option. I, I believe the option of raising hand is there. So if you have a question, avoid really interrupting a lot. If you have, you just go to the chat section once I'll be going to the chat or I'll be directed whenever there is a question to cover on that. So basically to start us off, this was a noble idea that ICPA developed because they really wanted to guide us to give us uh, the necessary examination tips to also know how to plan accordingly for the management accounting paper and also to sharpen our time management skills during exams. Because you find you, you may have prepared well for exams, but if you fail to, manage your time accordingly, you may fail to complete the paper. And uh, that really reduces your chances of, of, of passing the management accounting paper, getting the 50%. Because all of us at this point, we strive to get the 50% within the limited time that is there. So we'll, I'll also be guiding you through some few practice exam techniques that we have, and then also making a link between the different topics that we have. In management accounting, we have less of case studies. We don't have a lot of case studies. So this part of case studies, you will get it in other, other units. Basically, in management accounting, to those who are doing CPA professional papers for the first time, this is a three-hour paper. You have three hours to do the exams. And uh, before the three hours, you have 15 minutes reading time. In this time, the examiner gives you 15 minutes to read the question paper. You have a chance to read the question paper, but you are not allowed to 
write on your script. So in this case, you can only read the question paper, but you cannot start writing on your answer booklet. So you have a total of one, around approximately 180 minutes. That is three hours to do, but there is the 15 minutes reading time. In management accounting, we have a total of seven questions, but uh, you are only required to attempt five questions and each question is 20 marks. So 20 times five, that gives you 100%. Now, marks are allocated at the end of each question and are shown at the end of the question. For example, if we have question one, question one may be divided maybe, for example, in three parts. Maybe the first part is 10 marks, part A of question one. There is part B, which is five marks. There is part C, which is five marks. So at the end of each question, marks are clearly allocated. So the amount of effort, the amount of work you do, the calculations you do is guided by the marks that have been allocated to each question. So if you find a question has got more marks, certainly that demands more of you. If you find a question has got two marks, there is less that will be required of you compared to a question that has got more marks. Now, in all CPA exams, you must show all your workings. If the marker finds an answer, but you have not guided the marker on how you got your answer, you, you would lose marks for your working. So you must show any results that you have, you must show what led you to the results. You must clearly present your workings, which are also awarded marks. Now, in this case, we are also saying that uh, reading the question and understanding the requirements. As you start this paper, you need to identify the instructional verbs. In every question, you must be very clear on, for example, if it is question one, what are the verbs that are there? Have you been asked to describe? Have you been asked to list? You must identify the verb because the verb will guide you on the answer that you'll be presenting. For example, if you have been asked, list the causes of maybe a particular fact. I, I still don't want to go into detailed syllabus. You need to list, you don't need to explain. If you've been asked maybe what, what are some of the roles of uh, a management accountant? List the roles of a management accountant. In this case, you will say that a management accountant is maybe involved in planning, that is listing. Number two, control, that is listing. Number three, decision making. But if you have been asked to explain, you must say that management accountant is involved in planning. And then you explain what planning is. By listing, and you have been asked to explain, you will lose marks for explanation. So if you've been asked to list, you must list. If you've been asked to explain, you list and you explain whatever you have listed. For example, if you say that the role of management accountant is involved in decision making, you must now explain what is decision making. You may say that decision making is a choice between alternatives. If you have listed that it is control, you must explain what control is. Maybe you can say control involves comparison of actual results to the plan to get the difference. You must explain, that is the point. There may be more than one thing to answer within each requirement. So be very careful when you are reading the questions to in order to identify all the sub questions that have been given there because you may be asked to do more than one one there may be more than one requirement in a given question so before you attempt a question make sure you are comfortable with all the requirements i'll be coming back to that when i'm guiding you how to select the questions and also make sure that you are answering the question set and you are not answering your own questions for example, if I go back to what I was talking of, the role of management accountant. Ensure you explain the role of management accountant, but not the role of management accounting as a subject. Make sure you answer the question that you have been asked to, to answer. Now, whenever you are answering questions, there are some tips you need to 
look at what should you factor ensure number one you will be expected to manipulate numerical information so you'll be given some data you'll be given some figures and it's you now to generate your answer from the figures that you have been given for example if you've been told to to maybe prepare an operating statement in variance analysis you will be given data that will enable you to calculate all variances and it's now you to play around with the numerical information that is the figures the data that you have been given so you are given data and it's upon you to manipulate them in order to prepare an operating statement and you use the of course the techniques that you learned when you are reading number two you must be in a position to once you've manipulated the data you must be in a position to interpret the information for example if we are in a topic called maybe make or buy decisions you've already done your calculations for the make option you've already done your calculations for the buy option now it's upon you to interpret the results that you have already calculated so you must now lead as to the decision you don't do your calculations and leave them hanging you must lead us to the answer should we make or should we buy in that case you'll be interpreting the information so don't only do the calculation if you've been asked to make a decision failure to give a conclusion you'll also be losing marks on that okay so basically you must be in a position to interpret all the data that you have now the most important thing in an exams room is planning and uh, the examiner is very generous in this case the examiner has given you 15 minutes reading time these 15 minutes you have been given in order to plan accordingly make sure you make good use of the 15 minutes because that is the planning stage your success in passing these exams or failure in these exams it may be at the beginning it all depends on how you plan effectively within the 15 minutes reading time so normally what what we advise in this case don't start the question immediately you get that some people within the 15 minutes they start writing in the question paper those 15 minutes we normally advise that you utilize them you plan for them accordingly and my suggestion is this out of the 15 minutes reading time you can use the first 10 minutes to skim through, through all the seven questions remember you have seven questions and out of them you'll be choosing five out of the 10 minutes you can take 10 minutes to read through all those questions remember you are skimming through you may not have 10 minutes may not be enough to read into details and understand so these 10 minutes you skim through all the seven questions now once you have skimmed through all the seven questions identify the topics from which each question is from maybe topic question number one is from the topic standard costing you just need to note this one is from standard costing now quickly you need to search yourself evaluate yourself am i very good in standard costing maybe question two is on budgeting question three i'm just guessing is decision making question four maybe is on materials question five is maybe cvp etc you must identify the topics from which each question is now there will be no two questions from one topic so normally the way the exams are scheduled there can be two topics in one question but there will be no two questions from one topic so for example question one can be testing on two topics but question one and two cannot test on one topic so out of the seven questions due to that the seven questions will be will be spread through the entire syllabus so ensure you practice on everything now choose the five questions out of the seven you can attempt once you have listed the topics from which each question is you now need to identify five questions out of seven 
We also recognize that you may not be comfortable in all questions. So you choose five questions out of the seven. What is the order in which you'll choose the five questions out of seven? Of the five questions, you rank them in the order in which you will attempt them from the first to the fifth. Remember, it is not a requirement that you start with question one, you go to question two, you go to question three, no. It's you to choose the order in which you'll attempt the questions. But ensure that if you start with question five, don't do question five and then you go to another question. Maybe you do question five in page one and page two. You go to question two in page three and then you come back to question five in page four. Once you decide to do one question, follow it until you complete it is when you go for the next question. So in this case, out of the five, list them in the order that you will attempt them. Maybe you want to start with question seven and then you go to question one and then you go to question four. Now, how do you rank the questions? How do you list the questions in the order in which you want to attempt them? Remember that ranking is based on your ability to attempt all sections of each question. Only attempt question seven, for example, as your first question, if you are comfortable that you are in a position to answer all sections of question seven. Don't have question seven as your first question if you can only get five out of 20 marks. Your first question should be the question that you can maximize points on. I believe the first question should be a question that you are comfortable and you can get at least 15 marks out of 20 marks. If you cannot get all the marks, at least you can get 15 out of 20. Now we are saying that you start with the question you are in a position to maximize marks on. So of the five questions you have listed, you must list them in the order that you can attempt them. So your first question should be the question that you have the probability of getting the maximum points on it. Maybe you can get 20 out of 20. Maybe you can get 18. Maybe you can get 15. But it must be the question you are most comfortable with. Now, ensure that for each question you attempt, you are comfortably in a position to get 15 out of 20. Why do we choose 15 out of 20? We recognize that it's really difficult to get 100%. Let's be, let's be very clear here. Rarely do we get 100%. That's why ICPA sets a pass mark of 50%. So in this case, we, we are reasoning that maybe you cannot get 20 out of 20. So the first question you, the first three questions actually you choose I advise that these are questions that you can comfortably get at least 15 marks out of 20. Now you see that if you can get 15 marks out of 20 for the first three questions, that is 15 times three. That gives you averagely 45%. It means if you are in a position to get 45% out of your first three questions, and here I'm really not, I'm really pessimistic here. I'm saying that this is the worst that you can get in maybe the first three questions you attempt. Remember, you, you, are, you, you can still lose five marks out of these five questions and you are still safe. Once you attempt the first three questions, you'll still be remaining with some two questions that maybe you are weak in. And in these two questions, maybe you get 10 marks each. That will be 10 times two, that gives you 20. If you add 20 to 45, you'll be in a position to comfortably get 65. Remember 65, you did not get 20 over 20 in any question. You got 75% in question one, 75% in question two, 75% in question three, 50% in question four, and 50% in question five. With that, it still gives you an average of 65%. So how you plan the choice you make of your questions will really influence how you finish and whatever score that you will make. Also remember that the strategy you put in place must be decided in the first 10 
minutes reading time. Many students lose marks or fail to complete the paper because they did not take care of the 15 minutes. They started a question, left it halfway, went to another question. That means you are not organized. You did not plan accordingly. So remember, the strategy you put in place, the strategy must be put in place within the first 10 minutes that you have. Your success will be depending on how effectively you plan in this case. And also we have said, and the principal examiner also said, that really you should, we don't target that you get 100%. If you got 10 over 10 in five questions, that's still a pass. So what I'm trying to say in this case, to pass, you don't need to get 20 out of 20 in each question. Maybe question one, you can get 18 marks. Question two, maybe you get 15 marks. Question three, you get 13 marks. With all that, as your marks continue to go down, depending on how easy the questions are, you may still find that within maybe the first four questions, you have already exceeded the pass mark. Or within even the first three questions, you have already exceeded the pass mark of 50%. Now, there will be easy marks available in all sections of the exams and students who answer these questions usually perform well how you manage your time is very important here don't start with the hard questions start with the easy questions and again i found out that there is another problem that we face you find that if there is an easy question people tend to take a lot of time in that easy question you attempt the question, you take more time to review, you'll be wasting a lot of time. So make sure you start with easy questions and you take the shortest time possible in these easy questions that you have. In management accounting, out of the five questions that you have, basically you have an average of around 30 minutes per question. If you take more than 30 minutes per question, know that you have eaten the time of another question. So averagely plan with your time. Maybe you have a watch there in exams. Plan your time. Don't take more than 30 minutes in a question. If you find that maybe the first question took you 40 minutes, know that when you are going for the second question, you have already lost 10 minutes in the first question. So try to recover those 10 minutes you lost in the first question. Try to recover them in the second question. So ensure averagely you take 30 minutes. Why 30 minutes? You have a total of three hours. Three hours is 180 minutes. So if you were to attempt five questions times 30 minutes, that is, that is 150 minutes. If you can be disciplined enough and you take 150 minutes for the five question, you'll still have 30 minutes at the end of exams to review each question, to see where you went wrong in each question. But if you take more than 30 minutes per question, you will not have time at the end to, to revise whatever you have done, to see if you made any given mistake. So I always advise when you are attempting question, be done with that question, but don't go back to it to see if you did it well or not. Once you complete that question, go to the next question, go to the third question, the fourth question, the fifth question. Once you are done, you now come back in your last 30 minutes if you managed your time properly. So averagely take 30 minutes to do each question. Students who do not manage their time and miss easy marks may make it much harder for themselves to pass exams. So make sure you manage your time well. Actually, we are normally told accounts is about, we are all doing an accounts professional cause. Accounts is about speed and accuracy. So if you are very fast, that is, we are testing on speed and how accurate you are. So if you are accurate, there is a chance you will pass these accounting exams. And also you may be accurate and you are not fast enough. So you must work on your speed. How do you work on your speed? By practicing as many past paper questions as possible. Practice your, every question and set time in every question you attempt. Don't wait until exams is the first time you are attempting a question. 
practice them. Work on your time before you go for the exams. If it is a standard coasting question, work on it. You see, averagely, how many minutes can I take to attempt a 20 minutes, sorry, a 20 marks question? So try to work on your speed. And we have said speed, you can only work on it by practicing as many questions as possible. Number three, you must make sure that you are using your exams time effectively to identify any questions that you can easily tackle and plan the order in which you will answer those questions. I've already mentioned it when I was introducing. So you must plan the order in which you will attempt the question, starting with the easiest to the least easy. Now, what are some of, and here let me give a disclaimer before I start. All topics, we have averagely around 14 to 15 topics in management accounting. I'll explain them as we continue. Note that all the topics are testable in management accounting exams. All the topics ranging from the first topic, which is normally nature and purpose of cost and management accounting, to the last topic, which is normally standard costing, all those topics are testable. Let's be very clear from the beginning. However, we, I did some analysis and I looked at frequency of questions. What is frequency? Questions that are reg regularly tested. I'll show you that projection as we wind up. Now, in variance analysis, variance analysis and standard costing is a very, remember I've started by saying all topics are tested, so don't misquote me in that. Variance analysis is a very common topic in exams. You will see it when I project the past papers, when I project the questions that have been set. So variance analysis, in this case, you must know all the variances, ranging from sales variance, and in sales variance, you must know both the sales price variance and sales volume variance with their formulas. I will give you a sample later on. Materials, you must know material price variance and material usage variance. Under labor, you must know the labor rate variance and the labor efficiency variance plus the formulas. Variable overhead variances, you must know the variable overhead expenditure variance and the variable overhead efficiency variance. And also on the fixed overhead variances, you must know fixed overhead expenditure variance and fixed overhead volume variance. Remember, fixed overhead variances depends on whether you are using marginal costing or absorption costing. In absorption costing, we have fixed overhead expenditure and also fixed overhead volume. But in marginal costing, we only have fixed overhead expenditure. Now, you must know all these variances. There is a question. Kindly let's mute if you don't have a question. I'm hearing noise in the background. Is there a question? Okay, let's continue. Kindly let's all mute or the host can mute the others. I'm hearing, including the panelists, so that there is less echo. So in this case, we were talking of this. Once you have known how to calculate all variances, you must be in a position, what is the objective of doing variance analysis? You must be in a position to prepare what we know as operating statement. Now, operating statement summarizes all variances. So you must calculate all variances and at the end of the day, you must be in a position to prepare an operating statement. Okay, okay, okay. Let's mute. Okay, so let's be back to. So we are saying that what should you? You must be in a position to revise all variances. However, however, advanced variances are not in this section of what we call planning and operational variances are not tested in this section so you must be in a position to calculate all the 
the basic variances and I've listed them and summarized them through an operating statement. Remember, an operating statement normally starts with valued profits and it ends with actual profits. I'll give you a sample later on. Now, the second topic is budgeting. In budgeting, there are three key areas of budgeting. You must be in a position to prepare a cash budget, a cash budget, you must be in a position to prepare fixed or flexible budgets, and you must be in a position to prepare all functional budgets. Now, functional budgets, there is the sales budget, there is the materials budget, there is the labor budget, there is the variable overheads budget. And of course, fixed and flex, they are part of functional. So when you're revising on budgeting, yes, there is the theory part of budgeting. You must know the definition of budgeting. For example, a budget is defined as a quantitative plan of action prepared in advance of the period to which it relates. Once you have known the definition, you must know why do we prepare budgets? You must look at at least eight reasons why we prepare budgets. There is also a theory question which is on the steps in the budget making process. If we had time, we could have gone in details. But as the principal examiner said, this is not a lecture. We are just guiding you on how to prepare adequately for exams. In process costing is the next topic. In process costing, you must know how to prepare basic process accounts. When I talk of a basic process account, this is a process account that does not have opening and closing work in progress. We call that a basic process account. But you must also know how to prepare process accounts with closing and opening work in progress. I will give you a sample question on process account with opening and closing work in progress in my last one hour. Now, so in process costing, I must recognize many people don't attempt these process costing questions. But remember, process costing, if you revise adequately, you can maximize on max on this. Because process costing questions, preparing the T account of process costs, you can get between 12 and 16 marks. So I advise you really practice on this because you can easily get all marks on process costing if you revise adequately for this. Now, we have some costing techniques, marginal costing and absorption costing. You must also be very comfortable on preparing profit statements, either using marginal costing and absorption costing. Yes. Remember, marginal costing is also called variable costing. Absorption costing is also called total costing. Okay. Next, decision making. Now, decision making, of course, there is the process of decision making, but make sure you are very comfortable with decision making. In this case, I'm referring to make or buy decisions. Should we make a product or should we buy it? Should we close down a department or a product or should we not close it? Maybe you find sometimes that a department is making a loss, but there are some factors that you will have to do to consider before you close down that loss making department. Maybe that department is making a loss, yet it is supporting other departments. You cannot close it just because it's making a loss. So you must look at all shutdown decisions. Now in decision making, you must also have what is called limiting factors. And here it is, uh, we are not looking at multiple limiting factors. Multiple limiting factors is tested in business mathematics, where we have linear programming. In, line, in, in limiting factors in decision making, in this case, it's just the single product limiting factor. Don't go to the linear programming side. That is in, in business mathematics F1.1. In F2.1, it is just single limiting factor, when we only have one limiting factor. In business mathematics, we have more than one limiting factor. So you must also know the relationship between the subjects you are doing. 
all relationship between all the subjects in foundation, you must know what is tested in which paper, what is tested in management accounting, and what is tested in quantitative methods, business mathematics and quantitative methods. Now, you must also be comfortable with cost estimation. Now, there are different techniques that are used to estimate costs. Actually, there are five techniques, if I was to teach. There is the high-low method, there is the regression analysis. We have other methods which are not tested in management accounting, but you will meet them in strategic performance management in advanced level. So in, in management accounting, the costing estimation techniques you should know, number one is high-low method, and number two, you should also know regression analysis, okay? Plus the formulas. Remember, in regression analysis, you must know the, how to calculate the value of variable cost per unit, which is normally abbreviated with the letter B. You must know the formula for variable cost per unit, and you must also know the formula for fixed costs. Formulas are not given in exams, so you must master them before you go for exams. And finally, there is a topic on materials. Now, materials is quite a wide topic. Materials, you must know stock levels. And when I talk of stock levels, in this case, I'm talking of economic order quantity. I'm talking of economic batch quantity. I'm talking of reorder level. I'm talking of minimum stock level. Minimum stock level is also called buffer stock, is also called safety stock, is also called security stock. I'm also talking of maximum stock level, under stock levels, and uh, average stock and also components of total cost. There are three components of total cost which you must also revise. In that case, you must also be familiar with what are the components of purchase cost, what are the components of holding cost, and what are the components of ordering cost. All that are covered under stock levels, but there is also stock valuation. Stock valuation is basically testing on do you know how to calculate the value of your closing stock? When I make my sales in my shop, at the end of the day, in the evening, the stock that I remain with in the evening is what we call closing stock. Do you really know how to calculate the value of closing stock? And in this case, we'll be testing on FIFO method and AVCO method. You must be comfortable to value stock using either FIFO method or app, not either. You must know the two methods. You know, either it's like I'm saying that you are to choose one and leave the other. And I'm concluding by saying in that area so that you don't misquote me, note that the choice of the topics has been based on the regularity of questions from each topic. I hope we are together there. Now, what are some of the mistakes that we make that make us not to pass management accounting. If you plan accordingly for management accounting, you will pass the exam. But sometimes we find that there are some small mistakes, what I call common pitfalls that we make in management accounting that makes somebody not to pass management accounting. So make sure you don't make these mistakes. You know, take advantage of mistakes that were made by other people, you work on them, so that you don't make the mistake. So the first point is lack, lack of ability to interpret the calculations performed with reference to the scenario given. You must be in a position to read clearly the question and be in a position to interpret what the examiner asks. And when we talk of lack of ability to interpret the calculations is, for example, I've given you an example of shutdown situations or decisions. In this case, you have done, you have done your calculations for maybe, maybe, let's even talk of make or buy decisions for the make decision. You have done your calculations for the buy decisions, and then you just leave them hanging there. You don't conclude. In that case, you will not be in a position or you have calculated your make. 
you have maybe found your make option is 1,000. Your buy option is maybe 1,200. In that case, make is cheaper than buy. Because you didn't know, maybe you choose your answer to be the buy. You choose that 1,200 is the answer. In that case, you lack the ability to interpret the, what? The calculations performed. Number two, poor interpretation of data. Maybe you have read a question, and in reading a question, this is just an example I'm giving. The examiner asks you to use FIFO method in inventory valuation, and you, you choose to use AVCO method. Or in standard coursing, standard coursing also uses FIFO and AVCO. Maybe in standard coursing, there is a you have been asked to prepare an operating statement using marginal costing. And you, you prepare it using absorption costing. You will lose marks for that. So that is a very common mistake that, again, people make. Number three, poor technical knowledge and failure to closely read the question. Poor technical knowledge is you are going for the exams if you are not fully prepared for the exams. Remember, when you are going for exams, you should be an authority in that field. You have read adequately for, for, for that, and you have knowledge on it. You know, there is a difference between data, data, information, knowledge, and knowledge. Maybe you are just informed, but you don't have knowledge on it. So make sure you have technical knowledge on every topic. What every topic requires, what every topic wants you to do in order to complete the question. Don't just read and fail to practice. How will you advance your technical knowledge by practicing? And that is related to the last point, to the next point, sorry. Not enough practice of past paper questions. Ensure at least you practice averagely three to four questions per topic. If you practice four to three to four questions per topic, you'll be an expert. You'll have technical knowledge on that particular topic. For example, if it is something on cash budget, ensure you practice at least three cash budget questions. Don't practice only one past paper question on cash budget and you think that question is enough. Practice a number of questions and I will share with you in every topic, I'll share with you questions in past paper questions in every topic. So you will not have an excuse in that. Make sure you practice enough questions in every topic. So, and which questions? Practice past paper questions. Because most cases, these questions, you know, questions will always be the same. What changes is just the figures and maybe the the essays that are written there, but the concept remains the same because you already have the syllabus that you should follow. Now, on this first part, I'm concluding by saying the first part of my presentation, make sure that you are always thinking about those four pitfalls, those four mistakes. What are the four mistakes? Lack of ability to interpret, poor interpretation, poor technical skills, and not practicing enough questions. Make sure you are always thinking about those four points during your revision. And remember, this is the time you should be revising. And that each time you practice a question, you are thoroughly reviewing your answer afterwards to identify if you need to work on any of these areas. So once you attempted a question, review. There is a false hope that people always have when they are revising. When you are revising, I always advise you attempt the question. Keep the answer away. You know, sometimes I go to our library and I find somebody reading the question and reading the answer. That will not help you. You may have false hope. You may convince yourself you've understood yet you have not understood any given question. So when you are attempting questions, once you have read what, what you pass through, whether it's self-study or you pass through class, 
ensure you attempt questions. Once you have attempted the question and completed it, that is when you look at the answer, if you have the answer. Don't read the question and you read the answer. You will not be learning anything. Actually, you will think you have understood, yet you have not understood anything in that. So when practicing a question, keep the answer away. Do the question until you complete it. Once you have completed, I'm, I'm talking of when you are revising. Once you have completed the question, that is when you review the answer step by step. In the part A, what mistake did I make? That is in the introduction. In the main body of the question, is there a mistake that I make? You compare your answer now to the, you compare your working to the answer. Don't read the question and you read the answer. I hope we are together in, in that. So that is the first part. Remember I said I'll divide my session into three. Is there any burning question before I continue? Any quick question that I need to answer before I continue? So remember, it was a three hour session. So I've completed the first part. And uh, you can see it's, I'm still remaining in the two hours. I'm really trying to work within the time allocated. So in the first part, I've guided through, what have we looked at? I've guided you through the planning stage of exams. How should you plan for exams? How should you take care of them? How, what should you, how should you choose the questions you are to attempt? How should you attempt the questions? What time should you allocate to each question? We have comfortably looked through that. We have talked of in each question, you should take averagely 30 minutes. We have talked of the first 15 minutes reading time, read through all questions, list the first five questions you will attempt, list them in the order that you will attempt, starting with the most easy question according to you, to the least easy question according to you. Remember what is easy to me may be difficult to another person. That's why I'm saying according to you. Now, maybe let me take some few minutes, five or so minutes to look at the topics that we have in management accounting. Now you can see the first topic, I've divided the syllabus the course outline from ICFA manual, for, from ICFA website, I've divided it into 14 parts. So the first topic, which is normally theoretical, does not have any computation, is on nature and purpose of cost and management accounting. Now, there have been quite a number of questions on nature and purpose of cost and management accounting. Maybe you can screenshot these or maybe I can find a way of sharing with you. We can always find a way of sharing out this. Maybe if, uh, if maybe other panelists permit, if you need me to share with you this, you can type your, your email address in the chat section. So I can share with you so that at least you know that in every topic, what are the questions you can revise in each? topic. So I looked at all past papers and each question I was allocating it to a particular topic. So you can put your email address in the chat section. Somebody in ICFA will email you these, especially the past paper questions and the topics. So in topic one, we have nature and purpose of cost and management accounting. Now in this, there have been four questions on it. The first time that it was tested was in June 2014. Question one, part A, Roman, number one. Now, in nature and purpose, you can see the questions, you will have them at the end of the day. I should not go to details of the question. Let me just go to what is covered in each of the 14 topics, what you need to know. In nature and purpose of cost and management accounting, you can see it has been tested four times. So this is a topic you really need to practice on. Here, you need to know what is management accounting. You need to know what are the, what is the role and purpose of management accounting? What are the factors you need to consider in a good costing system? And finally, you also need to know what are the differences between management accounting and financial 
accounting. So in this topic one, you need to know differences between financial accounting and management accounting. You need to know role and purpose of cost and management accounting. You need to know what is the role of a management accountant or purpose of a management accountant. And you also need to know definitions of management accounting, cost accounting, ETC. When I go to explanations, I will take a lot of time. Yet at the end, I want us to practice some two or so questions, two to three questions. So allow me not to go to explanations. In that case, I'll be lecturing if I go to explanations. Number two, the topic number two is cost classification. Now, this is basically the grouping of costs. There are eight different ways in your syllabus that you need to know. Eight different ways of grouping costs. The first way, and you must know these and explain them. This is a topic that only has got grouping of costs alone. So you must know how to classify costs by their elements. When we classify costs by their elements, we have materials, labor, and expenses. Number two, you must know how to classify costs by their nature. When you classify costs by their nature, we have direct and indirect. I'm not explaining because of time. Number three, you must know how to classify costs by their function. When you classify costs by their function, they are classified into two production costs and non-production costs. Production costs and non-production. Non-production costs are normally divided into four. Selling, administration, distribution, and finance costs. That is the third way to classify costs by their function. The fourth way to classify costs is by behavior. When we classify costs by behavior, we have fixed costs, variable costs, semi-variable costs, and stepped costs. So when we classify costs by behavior, again, I'm not explaining. You have fixed, variable, semi-variable, and stepped costs. That is the fourth way to classify costs. You must also look at something called responsibility accounting. Under responsibility accounting, we have what is called cost center, revenue center, profit center, and investment center. I'm again repeating, under responsibility accounting, you must be in a position to revise on cost center, revenue center, profit center, and investment center. The next way to classify cost number six is by decision making. Now in decision making, Costs are basically divided into two, relevant costs and non-relevant costs. Relevant costs and non-relevant costs. You must know characteristics of relevant costs and characteristics of non-relevant costs. Remember, relevant costs are costs that affect your decision making. You must also know the difference between avoidable and unavoidable costs. And finally, you must know the differences between controllable and non-controllable costs. So under cost classification, you must know elements, nature, function, responsibility, behavior, avoidable and unavoidable, relevant and non-relevant, and controllable and non-controllable. The third topic is cost estimation. You can see it has been tested actually five times. It was even tested in June 2019. Sorry, I didn't include June 2019 in this. It was also tested in June 2019. Now, in cost estimation, you must know high-low method of calculating the variable cost and fixed costs, and also the cost equation. You must also know regression analysis. And I've given you questions when it was tested so that you are in a position to practice those questions. So in cost estimation, you must be comfortable with the high-low method of estimating cost. And you must be comfortable also with regression method of estimating cost. This least square is regression. Regression analysis is also called least square. So don't look for least square somewhere else. Least square is also known as regression 
analysis. So in course estimation, be comfortable with high law method and regression analysis and prepare adequately for it. Fourth topic is on materials. Remember materials is an element of cost. There are three elements of cost, materials, labor, and expenses. So in materials, for example, in December, remember we said you must be in a position to practice two main areas in materials. You must be in a position to practice stock levels and number two, stock valuation. Stock levels, we talked of EOQ, minimum, maximum, average stock, holding cost, ordering cost, all those are in stock level. In stock valuation, we have FIFO and AVCO. But there is once they also tested on LIFO. So just in case you can also practice on LIFO. So it was once tested on LIFO. But the one they frequently test on is FIFO and AVCO. Okay? So that is material. Next topic is labor. I've listed for you to the topics. Labor basically has got five areas you need to revise. You need to revise classification of labor. Make sure you have a good understanding on classification of labor costs. Because classification of labor costs affects all the other calculations you'll do. So you must know how to classify labor costs into direct labor costs and indirect labor costs. You must know what goes to direct labor costs and what goes to indirect labor costs. Number two, allow me to be very fast so that I have room to attempt two or three questions and also to give a chance to your questions. So I'll try to be a bit fast here. So there is the cl classification of labor cost. You must also know what is called remuneration methods. How do we remunerate? How do we pay our employees? Remember, we have two ways to pay your employees. You can pay your employees either a time-based system where you are paying them according to the number of hours they work or a units-based system where you are paying them according to the number of units they produce. Units-based system is also called output-based system. It is also called piecework method. Those are remuneration what? Methods. Remuneration methods are there for two. It's either time-based or output-based. Now, under time-based method, you must be in a position to calculate an employee's gross wage, gross salary, gross wage. And you must be in a position to calculate basic pay for basic hours. You must also be in a position to calculate overtime what we call overtime pay. You must also be in a position to calculate overtime premium. Now, there is also what we call in this topic called incentive schemes. You must also read on incentive schemes. What are incentive schemes? An incentive is a reward, a token of appreciation. What you give to somebody for a good, a reward for a good job done. That is what we call an incentive. Another word for incentive is a bonus. You must know how to pay bonuses. In your syllabus, there are two types of bonus. There is one called HALSI scheme, HALSI bonus scheme, and there is another one. HALSI is the first, if you can see June 2018, question 2C, when I'm talking of HALSI, and the second one is Rowan. You must know the difference between Halsey scheme and Rowan scheme. The formulas involved in each of them. Remember Halsey scheme, you calculate the bonus by taking time allowed minus time taken divided by two. Halsey scheme, the bonus is time allowed minus time taken divided by two. In Rowan scheme, you calculate it by having time taken divided by time allowed times time saved times the rate of pay. Okay? So you must be in a position to calculate incentive schemes. You must also know a theory part of that, factors to consider 
when developing a good bonus what scheme next you must look at remuni uh, measurement sorry measurement of labor how do we measure labor there are three three ways to measure labor there is what is called labor efficiency ratio there is what is called capacity utilization ratio and there is what is called production volume ratio also some books call it activity ratio and finally you must know how to calculate labor turnover what is labor turnover the rate at which employees are leaving a company so remember the formula is always replacement over average number of employees the next topic is overheads under overheads basically in overheads you must know how to apportion overheads you start by types of overheads there are two types of overheads general overheads and specific overheads you must know how to apportion the overheads how do you apportion the overheads there are three steps involved there is what is called primary apportionment also called allocation and apportionment remember when you are allocating and apportioning overheads, you must identify the most appropriate basis of apportionment. For example, when you are apportioning rent as an indirect cost, overheads are indirect costs. When you are apportioning rent as an indirect cost, you can use area. You can share out rent cost depending on area. So you must know how to allocate and apportion. Allocation refers to specific overheads. Apportionment refers to general overheads. Your step two is what we call secondary apportionment. Sometimes it is also called reapportionment. Remember reapportionment is now transfer of the service department overheads to the production department. There are four methods you need to know when reapportioning overheads. In your CF 2.1 syllabus, there are four methods you need to know. Number one, you need to know, have knowledge on direct method. Number two, step down method. Number three, continuous apportionment method. Sometimes it's called repeated distribution. And number four, you must know the fourth one. The fourth one is algebraic method or simultaneous equation method. So those under overheads. Now under overheads, there is the third stage, which is called overhead absorption. Under overhead absorption, you must know how to calculate the overhead absorption rate. Remember overhead absorption rate is budgeted overheads divided by budgeted activity levels. Now, you must also know how to calculate what is called overhead absorbed. Overhead absorbed is overhead absorption rate times actual activity. Our seventh topic is marginal costing and absorption costing. In this case, I don't need to say much. You must be in a position to prepare a profit statement using marginal costing. Remember, in marginal costing, you start with sales. You less variable costs to give you contribution. And then you less fixed costs to give you the MC profit, marginal costing profit. You start with your sales, you have your variable costs to give you contribution. Once you get your contribution, you less the fixed costs to give you, to give you, you less fixed costs to give you your MC profit. Under absorption costing, you start with sales, you less total cost of sales to give you gross profit. And then you less non-production costs to give you the absorption costing profit so in marginal costing and absorption costing you must know how to calculate the profit either marginal costing profit or absorption costing profit once you know how to calculate that you must know how to reconcile the two profits remember in the process of reconciliation you must know the difference in inventory was inventory increasing or decreasing and you must also know the fixed cost per unit fixed production cost per unit because why should you know that the difference between marginal costing profit and absorption costing profit is 
is change in inventory times fixed cost per unit. I'm repeating, when you are reconciling, the examiner is interested in knowing the difference between MC profit and absorption costing profit. What causes the difference in the two profits? The difference in the two profits is change in inventory times fixed cost per unit. How do you get change in inventory? You take closing stock, you compare it to opening stock units. So that is marginal costing. Our topic number eight is activity-based costing. This is also a very common question. These are normally called alternative costing techniques. They are alternatives to marginal costing and absorption costing. Remember, in activity-based costing, when you are apportioning overhead costs in activity-based costing, you apportion them based on cost drivers and cost pools. So remember, in activity-based costing, you should understand what are the cost drivers and what are the cost pools. For example, if there is a cost pool called machine setup costs, our overhead cost is called machine setup cost. The cost driver will be number of setups. So for every cost pool, you must identify the most appropriate cost driver. Now, in activity-based costing, you apportion overhead costs. And I'm saying overhead costs. I'm not talking of direct costs. I'm only talking of overhead costs. You apportion based on cost drivers. In absorption costing, which is the alternative to activity-based costing, it is also called traditional costing technique. That is absorption costing. You apportion based on either labor hours or machine hours. Apportionment of costs under AC is based on labor hours or machine hours. Apportionment under ABC, activity-based costing, is based on cost pools with their corresponding cost drivers. There are very many questions there I've listed which you can attempt. CVP analysis, cost volume profit analysis. In this case, you need to know what is the relationship between contribution and sales. In other words, what we call CS ratio. CS ratio is just contribution divided by sales times 100. So you must know how to find the CS ratio. That is number one. Number two, you must know how to calculate the break-even point, both in terms of number of units and in terms of revenue in currency. So BEP in terms of units and in terms of currency. Remember, BEP is fixed cost divided by contribution per unit. BER, that is BEP in terms of currency or in terms of revenue. BER is BEP in units times selling price per unit. Or fixed cost divided by contribution to sales ratio. You need to revise on that. So you need to look at BEP. Number three, you need to look at what is called margin margin of margin of safety margin of safety sorry for that interruption there is a box there a box so you need to know margin of safety margin of safety in this case the it's it's basically the number of yes the number of units above the above the BEP the extra units you sell to give you a profit, extra units that you sell to give you a extra units you sell to give you a profit. Now, that is on CVP analysis. So, what should you know? You need to know CS ratio, BEP, margin of safety, and there is also sales units to achieve target profit. I want to make a profit of one million. How many units must I sell in order to make a profit of one million? How many units must I sell in order to make a profit of one? Is there a question? Okay. So that is on CVP analysis. Under decision making, what should we revise under decision making? I had already touched on this as one of the major topics. You need to look at limiting factors. 
<laughs> number two, you need to look at shutdown decisions. And number three, you need to look at make or buy decisions. Make or buy decisions, sometimes they are called accept or reject decisions. So in decision making, you need to look at limiting factors. And when we have only single limiting factors, don't revise multiple limiting factors. That is tested in business mathematics. Next, that is topic number 10. We are almost there. There is a topic job, batch and service costing. You must be in a position to calculate total costs when we are having job costing, total cost when we are applying batch costing, and total cost in service costing. Now, you must know the difference between service organizations and product making organizations. What are the differences? Service, for example, services are intangible, products are tangible. Services are heterogeneous, products are homogeneous. Services cannot be stored, products can be stored. Those are the things you should, in differences, you need to look at. Now, in job costing, this applies to basically where the work we are doing, each, each work we are doing is unique. It is separately identifiable. In batch costing, this is where a number of products are made at the same time, where we are making a number of similar products at the same time. In service costing, these are non-product. Like for example, what I'm now doing is a service because what I'm doing is not tangible. It is a service. Now, how do you calculate costs in the three? Number one, you must identify the direct costs. How do you get direct costs? You take direct materials plus direct labor plus direct expenses to give you direct costs. Direct costs are also called prime costs. And then to their direct costs, you add variable overheads to give you marginal costs. To the marginal cost, you add fixed production overheads to give you absorption costs. And then to the absorption costs, you add the non-production costs to give you the total costs. So you need to know how to calculate this total cost. You start with prime cost, you go to marginal cost, you go to absorption cost, and then you go to total cost. There is also process costing. Now, under process costing, I had already said it, you need to know basic process accounts and advanced process accounts. Basic process accounts are process accounts without opening and closing work in progress. Advanced process accounts are process accounts with opening and closing work in progress. Maybe if I can assist here, any question in process costing that you see asking you to either use FIFO or AVCO, that is a process accounts question with both opening and closing work in progress. So process costing questions with opening and closing work in progress questions will ask you to either use FIFO or average cost method okay we can continue to budgeting what about budgeting budgeting is very wide remember i said you must know flex or flexible budgets you must be in a position to prepare a cash budget and you must be in a position to prepare all functional budgets all functional budgets and of course budgeting approaches also which is theoretical. And finally, standard costing. In standard costing, you must know all variances. I'll give you three samples of questions only because we have limited time. There will be a question, one question, I'll sample a sample on standard costing, one on budgeting, and one on process costing. Of course, I chose those. I was very selective in choosing there. There is where most people have problems. Process costing, budgeting, and standard costing. Yet they are very common in exams. So up to that point, that is the second part of my presentation. Is there a question until that point? You know, when I'm teaching through, through Zoom, I 
when I ask a question, I wait for 30 seconds before I respond. Is there a question? Stratum, you are speaking? So I can continue. 30 seconds has elapsed. Now, remember, I'm not lecturing, but I'm guiding you. Now, in the process of guiding you, I'm choosing three sample questions. You have very many questions that I've listed, which you can do. But I'm choosing three sample questions to attempt those three sample questions to show you how marks are allocated in those three sample questions. So remember, what is my objective in such a question? My objective is to show you how workings are done. That is number one. And also how marks are awarded. Because it is fair, I looked at at least three examples. And the three examples, I have very many examples, over 10 examples. But because of the time we have, we are uh, remaining with around one hour, 20 minutes. The time that is remaining, I want the last 20 minutes to be for questions and answers. So the time that is remaining can only allow you to give you three sample questions. Unless there is a question there, let me go to sample questions. So this also tells you online classes can work. So in this case, it's a proof that online classes can work. So in this case, let's, let's maybe pick three questions. Uh, I have a cash budget. There are very many questions that I have. You can see on the sheets there. There is an ABC question. There is standard costing. There is cash budget. There is process costing. And the others are process costing. There is also marginal and absorption costing. There is even overheads question. But I think, let me choose... Let me choose, I can start with maybe cash budget. I go to process costing and then I go to standard costing, whichever order I choose. Now, I did the tables to save time. Remember the tables, you can do it on your own. So let me start with a cash budget question. So allow me this sample question, I'll use to show you how marks are awarded how you need to do your workings and also how you need to make your work presentable. Remember, your work should be presentable. So I'll choose three sample questions to enable us present our work. So can you kindly follow me in these few minutes? In each question, I'll take about 20 minutes per question. So the following information related to this is a cash budget question. I've picked it from a past paper. The following information related to the proposed budget of KK Limited for the months ending 31st December 2016. So this is a cash budget question. Remember, I'm assuming we have read. Now I'm just helping you to revise by just having a sample question. So the following information relates to proposed budget for KK Limited for the months ending 31st December 2016. So this period is ending 31st December 2016. So we have sales. We have been given sales. We have been given, I'm selecting what I'm, I'm talking of. We have been given material purchases. We have been given wages, salaries. We have been given production overheads. You have been given administration overheads. These are 16 marks question. We have been given all that for the month of July until December. And then you have been provided with additional information. In the additional information, it tells you expected cash balance in hand on 1st July 2016 is 72,500,000 francs. Remember in the table, in the table, we were working in thousands. Those are the things you need to look for in exams so that you don't confuse. Additional information is in total, but the table is in thousands. So if you see this 72,000, you add the three zeros, that is 72 million. 
Be very careful when reading exams question. Remember to add the thousands. But in additional information, it is in full. So expected cash balance in and on 1st July 2016 is 72,500,000. 72,500,000. Next, we are being told 40% of total sales are cash sales. I will do that working. So you are being told this column, for example, in July, out of these 72,000 or 72 million, 40% of it was cash sales. That means 60% was, was credit sales. Make sure you understand. Next, number three, assets are to be acquired in the months of August and October at 8 million and 25 million respectively. Application has been made to the bank for the grant of a loan of 30 million and it is hoped that it will be received in the month of November. Next, it is anticipated that the dividend of 35 million will be paid in December. Debtors are allowed one month's credit. So remember additional information too. 40% of total sales is cash. 60% is there for credit. So you are being told additional information six. Debtors, the 60%, are allowed one month's what? Credit. Part seven of it, sales commission at 3% on sales is to be paid to the salesman. Required, prepare cash budget for six months ended that first December 2016. This question was 16 marks. And then there was a part of four marks, which was on a theory part of it. It was, it was actually explained the difference between a fixed budget and a flexible. And the other one, I've forgotten what it was. So I only extracted the 16 marks part. Now, when you want to answer such a question, you must organize your work. And I always advise the first page of any given question, the first page, let that page be for your main answer. And then the second page of your paper, your exams paper, is for your workings. Or the first page, you can start with all your workings. And then the next page, your answers. But I always advise the first page, for example, if it's an income statement, the first page should be the income statement. And then the inner pages, you show you are working the second page, which follows that question. Now, in order to prepare, a, now once you read this question, the first point is to know which topic is the question from. You know it is which topic. It is a budgeting. It is from the topic budgeting. That is the first part you have already answered. And that you answer in your first 15 minutes reading time. The second point we need to know, from which subtopic is this question? We know this question is from the topic cash what budget. Now, once you have known that, you try to reflect on what you learned in cash budget. Remember, in cash budget, it is a budget that shows your cash inflows. I did that just to save time. It also shows your cash outflows. And then it shows the difference between total cash inflow and total cash outflow. That difference is either called a surplus or a deficit. It is a surplus when inflows are more than outflows. It is a deficit when outflows are more than inflows. So that is, we've known the topic. Now we plan to start working on that. Now, any additional information that does not, we first of all come and read the question, divide it into two. We identify cash inflows. Cash inflows is what brings in money to the business. Cash outflows is what we spend on. Now, I believe when you read this question, there were a number of costs, and the first cost was sales. 
So I'll come and post my first cash inflow is sales. And remember to make your work as organized as possible. And I'll have into bracket working one. Why will I put there working one? Because there was an additional information on sales. You are told 40% of sales are cash sales. So I'll do working one and come and post my answers. Number two, we read through, we see any other inflow. Material purchases, that is an outflow we spent. Wages, that is outflow. So I can list those ones that I can see there. Those are outflows. I'll come and have material, material, material purchases. I'll put it under the outflows. Next, we have wages. Remember, I'm on this table here. And then next, we have production, production overheads overheads and then next we have administration administration station overheads so you see you should work, make your work as organized as possible so i'm done with listing these items sales is an inflow i've posted it there materials purchases it is an outflow wages is an outflow Production overheads is an outflow. Administration overheads is an outflow. Once you are done with this table, you go to additional information. Now, additional information tells you expected cash balance in hand on 1st July 2016 is 72,500,000. Remember, in in our, our workings here, we are working in thousands. Now, this is cash at the beginning of at the beginning of July. So, where do we post that opening cash? Expected cash balance in hand on first July 2016 is 72 million five hundred thousand. Where do you post that? You come and post it. It is your first cash. It is cash at the beginning of July. So there you'll come and post 72 500. Why have I posted 72,500? Because we were working on thousands. Okay, I've posted that. Point number two. That is point number two here. 40% of total sales are what? Cash sales. And I had sales here. I had sales there. And there is sales working. So I'll come down here and have my working one. Working one. I'll call it sales. My working one is sales. Now what I'll do, I'll come and pick on sales. And out of the sales, you know that there is the cash sales and there is the credit, credit sales. Let that be very clear. Cash sales, cash sales, we were told it is 40%. And that is how you should be doing your working. Credit sales is the balance. Therefore, the balance, if we take 40% to be cash, credit will be 60%. So that credit sales will be that. So in this case, I've already apportioned my work. So what I'll do, I'll just come and pick all sales figures for each month. I'll pick sales for July. I'll post it there. I'm just, I know how to use shortcuts but I'm avoiding shortcut formulas so that everyone can follow. Even those who don't have knowledge in Excel, that's why I'm typing. Otherwise, I know how to use shortcuts. So 70. In the next month, July, August, September, our sales was 86. I've picked 86. Our next month, October, our sales was 88,600. In November, our sales was 102. And in December, our sales was 108. Now you already know that. So I can come and work on these workings. So in these workings, I have July. So I'll have July in my workings, July until December. July, August, September until December. Now we are being told out of these July sales, July sales was 72,000 or 72 million. Out of that 72 million, we have been told 40%, 40% is 
which is the same as 0.4. 40% of that was, 40% of that was cash. So 40% was cash. Let me just remove those rounding off errors. So 40% was cash. So I'll repeat these. And in that same sales, 40% was cash, which was received in July. 60% of these was received in credit. Credit was one month, if you remember that. Credit was one month. So you calculate 40, you post it in July. And you calculate 60, and you post it in August. 60% of the same amount. So that is zero, sorry, sorry, 0 0.6 times 72, that is 60%. That is, again, let me round off to the nearest. I'm just trying to round off so that we don't have problems. So in this case, so I've calculated 40. I come, so 40, 60%. I come to the month of August. 40% of 97,000, 97,000, you post it there. 60% you post in September. For the month of September, 40% was cash. The other 60% you post like that. So you post that until the end. You post until the end. So these, these I've just scrolled. So 38,000 is 40% of that. I'll also scroll these other ones. So in this case, I already have, I've divided my sales. So total sales, total cash received, cash received from sales, total cash received from sales, you now add cash plus the, you add these two months, the cash sales in July. And also when we come to August, you add the cash sales from August and credit sales from July. When you come to September, you add cash sales in September and credit sales in August like that until you get the, to the end of it. So this one is equals to 28,000 plus zero. So you'll have that, it gives you 28. So I add for all of them. And then now I'm done with my first working. Now I'll come and post my first working, I've written there working one. So the examiner will look at this, the marker will look at this, and then he will go to your working because you have referred him to working one. He will go to your working and check on your working. I hope I'm clear there. So I'll just come and pick the answers. The answers are those. I'll just pick those answers for each month until the end. The month of August, I'll come and pick 82. The month of September, I pick 92 until I reach the end. So I've posted all sales. So I can go to, so I've completed additional information two and additional information six. I can go to the next additional information. In the next additional information we are being told, assets are to be acquired in the month of August and October at 8 million and 25 million. Acquisition of assets, that is a cash inflow. When we buy assets, we are spending money. So that is a cash outflow. So I'll call it acquisition of assets. It was not there in that original table. So we are being told assets are to be acquired in the month of August and October. So I'll go to the month of August and I'll post the amount. How much are we to acquire? 30 million, that is 30,000 because we are working in thousands. So I'll post that 30,000 there. Next, we are being told and the month of October, it was 25 million. I will go to October and post 25 million. I'll post my 25 million there. So acquisition of assets, I've posted that. <clears throat> I'm done with that additional information. I've already got all marks in one, two, and three. Every additional information has got marks allocated to it. So next, 
additional information for an application has been made to the bank for a grant of a loan of 30 million and it is hoped that it will be received in the month of november <clears throat> so in this case we have been told loan is a cash inflow when we receive a loan we are receiving cash so i'll post there a loan which month are we to receive the loan it is to be received in the month of november and it is 30 million i'll come to november and post the 30 million it is 30 million we are working in thousands next i'm done with additional information four i go to additional information five it is anticipated that a dividend of 35 million will be paid in dividends will be paid will be paid that is a cash outflow so i'll talk of dv dividends paid it is a cash outflow the dividends of 35 million is paid in december so i'll come to dividends i'll go to the month of december and in dividends in this case i will post the 35 million in december okay i've posted it lastly there is sales commission of three percent of sales is paid to salesmen each so there is another expense called sales commission sales commission commission and you have been told it is three percent so three percent three sorry three percent of sales you can okay three percent of sales so i'll come to my sales remember this was my sales so what I need to do, I'll need to get 3% of sales in each month. So 3% is 0 .0, 0 0.3, that is 30%. 30% is 0 0.3. So that will be 0 0.03. That will be 3% times the sales in each, in, in July, I pick that sales. It is given there. I'll repeat the same for the remaining months until December. So the next one is, okay. Uh, okay, I picked wrongly. The formulas that I picked, never picked them. I should have selected going down. So I'll go to the next one. The next one is 0 0.03. Sorry, 0 0.03 for the next August month. Okay, I was avoiding using formulas, but now I can use them. It is 30, it's 3%. I can use these sales to make my work easier. So let me just use that sales to make my work easier. So in this case, it is 0 0.03 times sales in July. I have that, and then I can repeat that for the remaining months. Okay, for the remaining months. So I can repeat all that for the remaining months. Let me round off. So I've already calculated 3% of the sales in each. Now I'm done with the question with the additional information. Now, once you are done with additional information, you now come and get the total. You get the total of that. Okay. Let me go to my functions and get the total. I'll get, I'm adding, okay, let me go step by step. I'm adding that plus the next cell which does not have so the total in july is 28000 the total in august is 82000 because it is only that the total in september is 92000 the total in october is that you see the total in november i'm adding that plus that 94000 plus 30000 and then the total in december is 104980 so i have my total cash inflows and then I come and post all these figures I didn't post. 
you remember i did not post i did not post material purchases i'll come and post material purchases in july i'll post that in august i'll post that in september i'll post the material purchases like that until the end october sorry that is october's yes i'll post also november uh -huh. and then i'll also post of december december i've posted everything sorry i was posting the wrong figures and those are the mistakes that we normally make so you can see purchases in september it is okay in august sorry in july is 25000 in august is 31000 in september we have in september we have 25000 in october we made a mistake so we correct that in october the purchases in october was 30000 the purchases in november purchases in november i go and pick it the way it is i post it i'm done with purchases that is two marks again in exams i go to wages wages i also pick the way it is wages in july i post it wages in in august i post it wages in in september i post it wages in october i post that wages in november i post that figure and finally wages in wages in december wages sorry wages in december i post that wages in wages in november wages in november i post it we are remaining with production overhead and administration i repeat the process until i complete so i'll go and pick production overheads i'll post it i have the option of selecting all of them but i'm just going step by step i pick the next month is 6000 the next month is 6500 the next product uh, the next production overheads is 8000 and the last production overheads i'll be picking the 8200 i've listed all my production overheads finally i go to administration overheads in administration overheads i also pick the way i've been picking the others i'll just pick the next remember i have the option of scrolling to select and to scroll but i'm just keeping that i pick that the next month i pick 8900 the next month i pick 11000 and finally i pick 11500 i've accounted for all my all my items i've already accounted for them so i get the total cash outflows so the total cash outflows i'll 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 sum up everything i'll get the total of materials the total of wages the total of production overheads the total of administration acquisition of assets dividends and sales commission i've added that so i add for every month july until december so when i add i get those results now let us be very careful here let us be very clear here posting is not a problem the next step now is to get the difference between inflows and outflows remember these were just sample questions i chose randomly so this is i get the difference between inflow and outflow so i'll have and take cash inflow minus cash outflow i get my results when you see bracket it means it's negative it means it's a deficit it means the outflow was more than the inflow so i post that until the last month now here i now have cash at the beginning of the year sorry cash at the beginning of the year i add the surplus or deficit if it is a surplus i add it if it is a deficit i minus it to give you so surplus plus cash at the beginning of the period gives you cash at the end of the period now you can see what i'm doing there
So I'm getting the total of surplus and cash at the beginning. So that gives me, okay. Gaetan, you've raised your hand. You can uh, ask your question. I always give 30 seconds. You ask your question. Have you raised your hand by a mistake? Gambozinza, you've raised your hand. Okay, let's continue because I'm not hearing you. So you've raised your hand, but you are not asking. Now, once you get cash at the big end of the period, cash at the end of at the end of July is the opening cash at the beginning of August. So cash at the end of July is the opening at the end of August. So what you do that you repeat that until the end. There is somebody raising his hand. I hope it is by mistake. If because I can't hear what you are saying. So let me continue. Maybe somebody can attend to that because I can't hear what you are saying. So I was saying cash at the end of July is cash is the opening at the end of at the beginning of and we repeat that until the end. So cash at the end of August is the cash at the beginning of you just do that cash at the end of September is cash at the beginning of October. You repeat that at the end and that is 16 marks. How is the marks distributed? You get marks for the workings. So for each of your workings, you get marks. For each, for your presentation, you get marks. You also get a mark for your title and the presentation. How you arrange your work. For example, you start with July, August, September. You've written there KK limited cash budget for six months ended there is a mark for your presentation and then the rest of your of the marks are for the workings and for the cash budget that is question one unless there is question one there is a question on cash budget remember in cash budget what should you show whether you understand the question or you don't understand the question give give the examiner the marker this format just give the marker the format you start with your cash inflow you list all your cash inflows and then you get the total cash inflow you list your cash outflows you list all your cash outflows you get the total cash outflows you get the difference between cash inflow and cash outflows it either gives you a surplus or a deficit and then the first additional information it told you there was 72 million cash we had at the beginning cash at the beginning you add your surplus or deficit plus cash at the beginning if it is a deficit you minus it remember that so to give you 52 that is a cash budget question now there are two participants who have raised their hands is there a question i'm not in a position to see your names if there is no question allow me to go to maybe which other maybe i can start with the process costing because i hear people saying it's quite technical so let's look at a sample process cost advanced process costing question so we are picking a sample so i've shown you cash budget how marks are awarded in the cash budget we have said marks are awarded for your title for your workings and for the main body for each point you make there is a mark and there is no negative marking what do you mean by negative marking once you have gotten something wrong you cannot be penalized twice for what you have gotten wrong so if your figure at the here is wrong you'll be penalized for that you will lose mark for that but when you move to the second period if you carry this wrong figure to the second period you'll get a mark for it there is no negative marking Okay, so let me go to maybe process costing. Now, in this process costing question, there are two process costing questions. There is one with the FIFO method, and there is one with AVCO method, average cost method. 
So maybe the most complicated one is normally FIFO. So let me choose FIFO. So let us read through this question. We see how we can present our work. Remember, I'm interested in how we present our work. Again, there are people who have raised their hands. Mm, the host, is the host available to find out? <clears throat> Maybe they have, been, they have been muted, I don't know. Okay, let's continue. So we are being told in this question on process costing, M limited produces an item which is manufactured in two consecutive processes. So M limited produces an item which is manufactured in two consecutive processes. Information relating to process two is as follows. Information relating to process two is as follows. We have opening work in progress, 800 units. And they are completed as materials, 100% complete, added materials and conversion. I'm assuming we have read on the topic. So I'll, it's like I'm revising a past paper question. Assuming, remember, we are not teaching. We are just guiding. So I'm assuming you have read. I'm just guiding you how you should present your work. Next, during the month, 3,000 units were transferred from process one, costing 18,100 units. Remember, M Limited produces an item which is manufactured in two processes. So there is process one and there is process two. Information relating to process two. This tells you, this information provided here is for process two. It is not for process one, it is for process two. I hope that is clear. During the month, 3,000 units were transferred from process one, costing 18,100. Added materials were 9,600. Conversion costs were 11,800 and closing work in progress was 1,000 units required. Prepare process two account using FIFO method. Now, in order to prepare process account using FIFO, there are three items the examiner tests on. Number one, they test on what is called equivalent units. Do you know the components of equivalent units? Number two, cost per unit. Do you know the components of cost per unit? And number three, do you know how to calculate the value of output? Now, please let's revise on equivalent units, cost per unit, and how to get the value of output. Now, how do we get equivalent units? Equivalent units, you always pick opening work in progress not completed. To it, you add units, of course. You add fully worked units. To it, you add closing work in progress units completed. You add abnormal loss or gain if there is any. And then you get total equivalent units. So what I normally advise students to do you first of all go to the process account. So you go to your process two account. I've given you the template of the process. Let's revise the template. In the template, it has got the debit side and the credit side. In the debit side, if you have revised, it normally shows the opening work in progress, materials, added materials, conversion, and abnormal gain. If the balance is on the credit side, on the debit side, it's an abnormal gain. If the balance is on the credit side, it's an abnormal loss. Because you have not done the question, I don't know whether it's abnormal gain or it is abnormal loss. We will confirm that as we continue. So I'll start with my opening work in progress. I want to post the units. I'll go to the question, opening work in progress, 800 units completed as. I'll come to the process accounts and I've seen it is 800. I post it under units. I post it under the units section. Now, once I post that, I'll now continue. I'll look, price is not given. Total amount, 
of the opening work in progress. Opening work in progress, you can see the question. Work in progress is 800 units completed as follows. You have been given this. That is the total. So you add all that. You add for materials plus for labor 600 plus for conversion, all everything for that. So opening work in progress, the total is 6,000. The total amount I come and post it there. It is 6,000. So I've already posted the work in progress. I come to materials. Remember to post items in the process account before you go to equivalent units. So I've posted opening work in progress. Where did I get 800? 800 is given there in the question. Where did I get this total of 6,300? It is added materials completed as opening work in progress completed as. I add this plus that plus that. It gives me 6,300. Now I continue with the question. During the month, 3,000 units were transferred from process one, costing 18,100. In process costing, output in process one is input in process two. That is a characteristic of process costing. During the month, 3,000 units were transferred from process one. Those were output from process one. Output from process one becomes your input in process two. So under materials, I come and post the 3,000 units. The output in process one becomes your input in process two. And the total cost was 18,100. So I'll come and write there 18,100. That is my process account. I go and check if there is any information on added materials and conversion. So I come, added materials, we've been given a total of 9,600. I'll come and post there 9,600 under the column of added materials. This is a T account. And also, I'll look for, I'll look for conversion. Were we given any conversion? Conversion is 11,800. So conversion is 11,800. Remember, I hope you have read, conversion is labor plus overheads. So sometimes the examiner will give you labor and he also give you overheads. But sometimes he combines the labor plus overheads and he calls it conversion. I hope we are together there. So conversion is labor plus overheads. So I have all my totals on the debit side. I'll go to the credit side. I also post normal loss. Normal loss is normally a percentage of input units. I'm repeating. Normal loss units is a percentage of input units. The examiner will give you a percentage. Let's see if we were given a percentage. We were not given percentage. Okay, this is good. It will help me explain some point. Now, let me come and explain. I'm also doing this question. So I've said normal loss, normal loss, is normally a percentage of input units. Let us be together there. It is a percentage of input units. So I come and check normal laws. Is there information on normal laws? I'm just skimming through. There is no normal laws. So you have been given conversion. So remember, there will be a question with normal laws. If there is normal laws, it is a percentage of input units. So in this case, normal laws was not given. So in this case, I will write zero the normal loss is zero the scrap price is the price used to value normal loss because normal loss units were not there scrap price is also zero total amount of course it will be zero also why is it zero because it is normal loss units times the scrap price per unit to give you the total amount so that gives us or it leaves us with the total amount so we have our output. Now we go to the question and check if we were given any output. This was quite a tricky question. You were also not given output. So you must find the output. So what else were we given? 
we were given closing work in progress as a thousand. So let me post what we were given so that we find what we were not given. So closing work in progress, you are given as 1000. Now we have posted everything we were given. Now, if there is no normal laws, if normal laws is also called expected laws, if we don't have any normal laws, there will also be no abnormal laws or there will also be no abnormal laws or Kajungu, do you have a question? So there will also be no abnormal laws or there will be no abnormal laws or gain. So in this case, because there is no normal laws, we will also have no abnormal laws. I hope we are together there. So abnormal laws will not be there. The abnormal gain will also be not there. Why is there no abnormal laws or gain? Because there was no normal laws. If there is no normal laws, there is no abnormal laws. So that leaves us with the output. Is so, there a uh, There are some people talking. Do we have a question? Kindly let's mute or the host mute for me those the people talking. So in this case, we get the total. So I'll go and get the I'll get the total there is 3,800. I'll also go and get the total of that. It's that. So in this case, we can see the total on the debit side is 3,800. This side should be the same as, so the total on the debit side is 3,800. You compare it to the dot total on the credit side. You post the figure that is more. If the credit is more than the debit side, you post the total of the credit side. If the debit side is more than the credit side, you post the total of the debit side. In this case, 800 plus 3,000 is 3,800. Zero plus 1,000, it is 3,000 what? 800. Now the balance will be the output. Even though we were not given, we are in a position to get it as the balance. It is the balance. So the balance will be 3,800 minus the 1,000. So our output, even though we were not given, we have calculated it. It was not given, but we have the closing work in progress. We have the normal loss, which is zero. So the difference to make it 3,800, that becomes the total of the output. Now we have everything. What is now remaining is are two items. We are only remaining with the total of the output and the total of the closing work in progress. How do we get that? We now go to this equivalent unit statement. Now, under our equivalent unit statement, I will get all these values. The first item in the equivalent unit statement is opening work in progress units not completed. Look at what I'm doing here. Opening work in progress units not completed. It's the first component of equivalent unit statement. So opening work in progress, units completed were 800. I hope everyone is following. Materials was 100% complete. If 100% is complete, it means zero is not complete because we pick opening work in progress not complete. So in that case, what I'll do, I'll go, to, I'll take 800, sorry, 800 times 0%. That gives you zero. Why is it zero? Remember, it is 800 times 0% percent because 100% was complete. 0% was not complete. That will be more clear when I come to part two. Added materials. Remember, it is opening work in progress, not complete. Added materials, 40% is complete. If 40% is complete, 40% is complete, it means 60% is not complete. 60% is not complete. So what I'll come and do there, I'll come and take 800 times 60%. 800 it gives you 480. 
I go to conversion. Conversion, 30% is complete. What is not complete is 70. If 30 is complete, 70 is not complete. So I'll also go, oh, oh. I've messed up the formulas. Let me post the figures. It was 30%. Okay. So I messed up that. So next, conversion. Conversion, 30% is, we say it is complete. 70% is not complete. So what I'll do, I'll come and take 800. Remember, 800 is the opening work in progress units. Times 30 is co complete. Therefore, 70 is not complete times 70 percent so that gives you 560 that is opening work in progress completed fully worked units now what is fully worked units fully worked units is output units output units i hope you are together fully worked units is your output units remember your output units is 2,800. I hope we are together there. 2,800. You minus your opening. S sorry. For... So fully worked units is open. I'm just typing. So that's why I'm taking time. Minus closing, closing work in progress units. I'm just giving out the formulas from what we we'll, you should have learned when you are revising. So our fully worked units in this case, fully worked units in this case, our output units is 2,000 or 2,800 minus closing work in progress is 1,000. 1,000 units. So you get that. Sorry, I did not use the formula. 2,800 minus 1,000. Minus 1,000 is the closing work in progress. It gives us 1,800. So fully worked units will be 1,800 throughout. This will be 2,800 for each segment minus 1,000. So it gives you 1,800. I also repeat this other side. It is 2,800 minus 1,000. 1,000. So we'll have our figure there. So we have our fully worked units. And then finally, we have closing work in progress units complete. We go to the closing work in progress, we are being told. Closing, remember, opening is not complete. Closing is complete. So you go to your opening work in progress. Your opening work in progress here is given there. And your closing work in progress is also provided. So you have your closing work in progress. In your closing work in progress, units are 1,000. So what you do, you take 1,000. 1,000 is the units of closing work in progress. I hope you are all seeing. Closing work in progress is 1,000 units. Material was 100% complete. So it is 1,000 times 100%. I get my value. For added materials, it is 1,000 times 60%. So times 60%. I get my value. For conversion, it is 1,000 times 40%. So I'll multiply that by 40%. I'll get my total there. So you, you have here abnormal loss or gain we do not have in this question. So I put 0, 0, 0. I gave you the format for everything. Now total equivalent units is equals to now opening plus fully worked plus closing work in progress plus abnormal loss if it is there. But this time we did not have. So the total is 2,800. 
the total of equivalent units for materials, it is different from labor, it is different from added materials, it is also different from conversion. So we are done with equivalent units statement. This is normally around five marks, equivalent unit statement. Now, finally, we get cost per unit. So under cost per unit, you go to total amounts. Now, total amounts, you can come here and see the total amounts for materials is 18,100. So I'll come here and pick the total amounts here is 18,100. Added materials, the total amount is 9,600. For conversion, the total amount is 11,800. I've picked that from the process account. Now we have the total amount. Please understand me. If there was normal loss amount, let us go to the process. If there was this figure here, you take the materials amount, you minus normal loss amount. I'm again repeating. If there was normal loss amount, you take materials amount, you minus the normal loss amount, and that is the figure you come and post under materials there. Now, total equivalent units column, we already had calculated this. You pick the total equivalent units from the first table. From the first table, the total equivalent, you pick from the total equivalent units because it's called total equivalent units. You also pick that we have cost per unit is equals to total amount divided by total equivalent units. I'm repeating cost per unit is total amount, total amount divided by total equivalent units. You get that, maybe I can round it to four decimal places. So I have that figure there. Okay, so we have our total there. So that is the total of total cost per unit. Now we come finally to value of output. Value of output, we normally calculate it as value of opening work in progress completed plus value of fully worked units plus value of fully worked. So I'm repeating value of opening work in progress completed plus value of opening work in progress not completed plus value of fully worked. Now, value of opening work in progress was given in the question completed so let's see here opening work in progress units completed the values were given i pick the values the way they are so i'll pick the value for materials i'll pick that for for added materials and for conversion i've picked them the way they are they are all they are provided and i can even get the total the total of that yes there is a question okay let's continue then if there is no question so i have the total of opening work in progress completed you get remember value of output is value of opening work in progress completed plus value of opening work in progress not completed plus value of fully worked. I already have the total. I already have the total of, of opening work in progress completed. So I go now to opening work in progress not completed. This one, I can get it from this table. I'm repeating. How do you get value of E? It's opening work in progress not completed, but these ones are units we are interested in the value. So in this case, I'll put it in brackets so that we remember. I'll put it in brackets so that we can remember that working. It is zero, this zero here, times the cost per unit, times the cost per, cost per unit, times that times the cost per unit. So, uh, or let me just do the, so that I get the totals. So here, opening work in progress not completed, it will be this zero there times 
the cost per unit of materials. I post it there, it is zero. I'll go to the added materials. The units there times the cost per unit of added materials. I have my figure there. Conversion, again, it is the units of conversion times the cost per unit of conversion. I'll have my total there. So this one, I did not round off. Let me, although I can round at the end. So I've rounded that. So I can get the summation. Summation is that I have the total summation. Okay. Finally, we go to fully worked. Now fully worked, again, the same thing we did in the materials in the in the opening work in progress not completed. So fully worked, again, I go to the first table. I pick my fully worked units. I multiply it by the cost per unit. I post my answer there. I come to the second one. I go to my fully worked, fully worked units. I multiply by the cost per unit. I get my answer there. I go to the third one. I pick my fully worked units. I multiply by the cost per unit. I'll get that. So, and then of course, I'll round up everything to the nearest whole number so that we are consistent. And then I'll get the total, auto sum. I'll get the total. So we said value, I'm concluding on this, value of output is value of opening work in progress completed plus value of opening work in progress not completed plus value of fully worked. So if I'm to get the total value of output, total value of output is equals to value of opening work in progress completed plus value of opening work in progress not completed plus value of fully worked. And I have that as 35. Now I come and post that, that is a value of output. I come and post it in the process account. Finally, we get value of closing work in progress. Closing work in progress was also given here. I hope we can see that. Now, because this, I didn't have a table for that, value of closing work in progress, I can work it. See how I'm working on it. Value of closing work in progress, we have closing work in progress, 1,000 times cost per unit. I close the bracket plus open a new bracket, 600 times this cost per unit, close the bracket plus the last one is open a new bracket 400 times cost per unit of that and you close the bracket and then you get your answer. So our answer there is we can get our final answer. Our answer there is let me round off to the nearest whole number. So we have the totals there. So I have my totals there. So my final answer is addition of, sorry, addition of that. Now I've completed everything. How do you know you have earned all marks? You come and add this plus this plus that. I've added the three. What has it given me? 45,800. You go and compare it to the debit side. It is also 48,800. That shows it as balanced. And you have earned all the 16 marks in process costing. That is process costing. Unfortunately, remember I said I had four sessions. The first session was overview of the exams, what you need to know about exams. 
The second session was overview of the syllabus. And the third session was sample questions. I've covered two questions. And we are remaining with around 20 minutes to end of the end of the session, which I believe has been informative. Now, in the last 20 minutes, I want to leave it for questions that we have. If there are no questions, I may do one more questions. But in the last 20 minutes, I wanted to leave it for questions. So let me go back to the host and fellow panelists to guide me in the questions and answers. Mr. Kajungu or Stratton, we are now on the yes. question and answer sessions. Yes, yes. Yes. Uh, I hope the session was so good. Yes. Uh, I had at some point to, to travel from work to home, but finally I'm home. No problem. So I hope they enjoyed because yes. the retreat I attended, I really did enjoy. Okay. Because I found you when you were attempting some questions and I was actually enjoying the flow of the, of the way you were actually attempting the questions. Mm -hmm. if they, they also enjoyed it, the way I enjoyed it, mm -hmm. I think it, it, it will be helpful for them. Because sure. actually, as I, as, I, as I said this at the beginning of, of the session, the, the mm -hmm. intention of this session was not to teach, but to yes. provide the approach and the exam tips of how you sure. can maximize uh, math. Yes. And then your main focus was on that. So I mm -hmm. hope you, 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 did a, you did a great job. Now, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm actually checking in the questions and answers box to see if there are some questions that are already there. Mm -hmm. Last in the chat. Uh, but I can see we don't have questions. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to welcome the participants or the students yes. who do have questions, whether they are specific to you or they want some clarifications from each part. I would like to welcome that kind of question yes, or comments or suggestions and, and whatever, and then we shall be going through the questions that will be raised mm -hmm. as we progress. Sure. So it's time for students to ask their questions. If you have any question, you can ask. Is there any question? Any question? Mr. Kajung, are they unmuted? I cannot see them. Yeah, it, you, you know, we, we've been and the Webinar participant is not allowed to speak. Unless so they can type participant. the questions. Yeah. So let's give them two minutes to type the questions if they have. If they don't have, then we can just wind up after two minutes if they don't have the questions. But we are giving two minutes. We can type our questions. Either the questions are directed to me if it is management accounting or to ICPA, if it is a general question. Uh, Charles. Yes. Can you pass over the host to me so that I can, I can allow them to? Pardon? 
pass over the host. I, I did not have the host rights. It was somebody, you, let me check who was at the host rights. You, you, you are the one, you check. You just click on my name and then you, you right click. I make you host or co-host? You can make me co-host. Okay. Okay, I've done so. Corinne, you can unmute, unmute and then you talk. Hello? Yes, Cory. Yeah, I have uh, an observation. Mm. Uh, first of all, thank you for the, I want to thank the, the presenter for having uh, explained uh, to us all the skills and what is required. Mm. Uh, I actually appreciate what has been done and the, I think it is helping us to, 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 to remind other people how we can uh, attempt other exams and uh, eventually pass. Yeah. Uh, there is uh, an entry that he made of, of assets, assets acquired. I think it was an error. He wrote uh, 30,000 instead of 8,000. 8, I don't know whether I'm wrong. Okay, okay. I'll have to check that. That is under, under which, the first question or the second question? The first question on no, no cash budget. Let me open it. Yeah. Okay, just continue. If you have another question as I open. Yeah, and I would also request that uh, we, we have more of these discussions. Like in a week, we can have them once. <laughs> That's why my, my, my just humble request. Because it, it helps us to, 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 to capture what we have, uh, we have read and even uh, give, gives us some confidence in answering questions. Mm -hmm. It's really, very really nice. Uh, yeah, of course. I, I'm, yeah. I'm sharing the slide. What were you talking of in the cash budget? Yeah, in the cash budget, uh -huh. an entry on additional information. Uh -huh. Uh, on uh, part three. Assets. The assets are to be acquired in the month of August. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, it was a bit unique, I could not understand. I mean, even someone asked it, I think, in the questions, in, in the chat. Okay, thank you. That is, uh, that is you, are, you are on point. You are on uh, point. Uh, that one there, I've changed it. Okay, thank you. That was a typing error. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm very happy for, for, for the whole discussion. Sure. Maybe to clarify on the issue of uh, the sessions, we share the timetable of how the sessions will be run yeah. from today up to 10th of this month. We shall be hosting different sessions. But uh, to be specific, uh, these sessions are specific on some papers, not on all papers. Yeah. Because we, we only looked at the problematic papers. We wanted to help some students, most especially in computation papers, to really have uh, some hands-on tips on how to approach the questions. And now, we based on the observations of, of the pathways, the papers that have been having low pass rates are the ones that we are focusing on so that maybe the pass rates can be uh, a little bit improved. Uh, plus, now we know it's a challenge because you do not get uh, tuition as always. So that's why we, we decided that we at least run some sessions, but for problematic papers only. Uh, I'm not quite sure which paper that will be there tomorrow, but there is a template that was shared to you. Uh, 
uh, you need to check that same table and you see which paper that you ingested before and which one that you attend. Because uh, it's not management, we, we, we actually planned three hours per session per subject. In other words, today's management accounting session will be done and dusted by end of this session. We will not have another session for management accounting because the, the, the intention and the rationale behind it was we want to provide exam tips, specific exam tips. We are not teaching. I want you to, to, to get it well because we know we cannot teach management accounting within three hours, but at least if you've read and you add the tips that you've been provided by the facilitator, it will help you to understand and approach questions confidently. That was our main objective. And you shall give us a feedback whether we are achieving our objective because at the end of it all, we need to make sure that we've achieved the objective. Uh, I think there's someone else who had a question. Gaitan. Gaitan, you can talk to us. Ngamaziza. Hello. Yes. Uh, sorry, my hand was uh, left up. I had, a, I had a similar a similar issue to, to what my colleague has just pointed out. It was so you don't have any to, other question. Yeah, it was, yeah. Uh, I, maybe another another clarification. Is the exam computer based or uh, paper based? It will be paper based. We don't have computer based. We are planning to introduce computer based exam, but specifically with CAT because oh, okay. it will be a progressive uh, transition. We want to oh, start okay. with CAT stage one, stage two, and then stage three. And then the moment we see CAT, we go to CPA because it's oh. not something that we do within one day. Okay. So the, the, the exam that we do will be like any other exam that we've done previously. Okay, thank you. Welcome. And then maybe there's another question I saw in the chat. Has the time for exams been released? When is the 2.4.1 exam going to take place? I can see someone else uh, reply to your question. Patrick, uh, I think management accounting will be on 4th of December. And please, you can access the general timetable on our website through students. You get the general timetable, and then I hope by end of this week, everyone will have received personal timetable. And something else I want to add on is uh, you need to check on the website or in your email and see the provisional list. Because you might be there struggling to grab the concept when you are actually not on the list. And we are not, when you're not on the list, it means you're not fit for the exam. So it's better you clear that you check on the provision list. If you have anything that you feel it contradicts what you anticipated, you tell us. You submit your claim so that when you publish the final list, you are there. So you can attend on T, go to our website on, 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 on students' toolbar, and then you get the provision list for either CA or CTA, and you check your name there. Or there are even the list. The links to the list are also on your email. Yes, is there any other question? Calling this here, maybe I can uh, I can uh, have uh, a humble request mm. of sharing us uh, with, uh, with this presentation and the questions. We will, for real. We will we'll share with you the presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome. We are still in the session of questions. 
Are you all contented with what you what you have already been given? Unless there's any other question, I would like to call no. upon Charles. Yes, yes. Uh, he, I don't know whether he, he will come back again because he answered only two questions concerning process costing and the cash budget. There was Thank another stop on question, question on variance. Our time is up. Our yeah. time is up. As I, as I have already told you, the intention of the session was on exempted. So if you attempted only two questions, I hope you clearly, so the way he applied the tips he gave you to approach the question. Yeah. You cannot get enough time to answer all the questions. Hmm. We are sorry for that. It's okay, it's okay. As, as uh, the principal examiner said, it was just a guide how to attempt mm. questions. So I had chosen the questions randomly out of a pool of questions. So that is how it was. The objective was not to teach, but to guide you on how to answer questions. So I believe with those two examples, if we had time, we could have looked at more examples. But you see, we must learn to work within the time provided. Leslie, you're welcome. You can talk to us. Thank you. I would okay. ask. I would like to ask if the there is also that what the this one for the other modules like financial reporting. Yeah, it is. It is there. Yeah. It is just you can tell us the win. Where you got the link for this one? There is also a link for other papers. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Charles, unless there's anything else you want to add on, I would like to call, to call off this session. I thank the attendees for your time, for your concentration, and it's all about practice and confidence. Let's practice in the remaining time that is we are remaining till exams. Is it 4th December? You have more than enough time to sharpen on your skills and remember to revise as much as possible the past paper questions. Maybe to Kajungu, is the, is the session recorded so that we can pick, we can pick the email addresses? There were email addresses in the chat section. If it was recorded, we are in a position to pick them. Yeah, it is. Yeah, then that's fine. Then they'll have to be emailed to us. They had requested the slides. Yeah. Okay, then that's fine. Thanks a lot to both ICPA being the host. And I think this is a very good initiative to, from ICPA. Yeah. Even moving forward, at least if we can be having three hour sessions to guide students, to prepare them for exams, even in the subsequent sittings, it's, it's really a very good and noble idea. And we congratulate you for that. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, we are always looking forward to improve ourselves. We still have a room for improvement. Mm. And uh, we, we actually have a lot that we need to do. But of course, it cannot be done within one day. Sure. Uh, what we hope is we are trying to do more because uh, more is in the pipeline. OK. Uh, we hope with the time, because this is something that we have been planning, I think, I think since last year, Mm -hmm. uh, to always run uh, revision. Actually, our plan wasn't to have a three-hour session. Our plan was to have more time. But due to the fact that, you know, it also requires, you know, a good budget, you have to look at that also. Because uh, cost-wise, uh, this is not a good time to incur a lot of costs due to what happened as a result of COVID. But we tried our level best. But we are planning to do more in the future. We are planning to always have revision classes 
for programmatic papers because we are also aiming at having good pathways. Sure. Yeah, so uh, I would like also to pass over my appreciation to all the participants. By the way, I would like also to pass over my request to you to also inform your colleagues so that we have a good number. We know this paper had, I think, around 150 or 200 students, but it's very simple to have 10, only 10, that is not even 10%. Yet it's a very important activity for someone who will sit for this paper. So pass over the information to your colleagues so that next time we have a good number of attendees. For those, for some of you who uh, who have looked at the timetable uh, and you have some other papers that you just had for and will be catered for, we shall meet in other papers. Otherwise, thank you so much. Thank you for your time. See you next time. Thank you so much. Welcome.